My name's Ken King. I'm a coach, a learning and performance consultant, and the founder and owner of the Boost Institute. This is Real Learning with Real People. These conversations are with real people. They're unscripted and they're designed to pull tidbits of information from people who are grinding right now to get the most out of their lives. With minimum amounts of editing and maximum authenticity, we strive to provide lessons that anybody will find effective, relatable, and entertaining. We seek to have guests that provide learning based on their life experiences. Some are chosen because of their experiences as high performers in sport, business, or education, whereas others have been chosen because they have meaningful lessons to teach, and I want to make sure they have the platform to share it with the world. The language in the videos can sometimes be mature, as I'm always encouraging my guests to just be themselves. This is all part of making sure that we do our best to give you content that is both authentic and effective, and that you feel like you can utilize the real learning in order to connect with these real people. On today's show, we have sport performance consultant Ron Watilla. And Ron's life has taken him to multiple countries as a coach, starting at the college level in Canada, then to the NCAA at Pittsburgh, Duquesne, and Robert Morris, and even further to be the GM and head of basketball operations for the British Olympic teams alongside current Raptors head coach Nick Nurse. He's been the director of athletics for multiple universities and currently is the president of RW Sport Performance Consulting and lead high-performance coaching advisor working with Own the Podium in Canada. Amazingly, Ron still finds time to be the director of the boys' side and one of the girls' coaches for a local club basketball program. I have the utmost respect and admiration for Ron's professional work, but also the way he interacts to pull something more from people and really help them level up, myself included. Let's dive into this extremely growth-oriented conversation with Ron Watilla. Hi, Ron. How are you? Ken, I'm well. How are you? I'm very good. And how how's uh, the the family? How's the weather, where, you, where you're at on your side of Calgary, how's that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, all good. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're split up at the moment. We got a couple up in the mountains. We got a couple here in Calgary and um, yeah, life is good. Family's safe and healthy. Cool. I've, you're, I'm trying to keep the how's the weather question going consistently and you're the first person that I've had who's in the same city as me. So, <laughs> and honestly, if there's any city to ask somebody else how the weather is, when you're both in the same city, it would be Calgary because it probably actually is different at your house than at my house. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't like to beat around the bush too much. I'd like to dive right in and, and uh, give our viewers and myself your background personally, what growing up was like, what family life was like for you. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm a Calgary guy, uh, born and raised in uh, Southwest Calgary. Um, uh, incredible uh, time to be uh, Growing up in the city, the, the city was, is going, was going through an amazing growth phase. I was born in 67, so kind of through the 70s and, and 80s, lots going on in, uh, uh, in Calgary. Um, uh, really involved in sport, had a bunch of really cool people around me, I did every sport imaginable growing up. Um, somehow fell in love with basketball. Um, I think it was mostly the, the, the fact it was a team sport at school. I think there were, I, as I look back on it, uh, knowing that I could do something in front of other people and get credit for it rather than hockey, where you were kind of, you went back and told people the next day, yeah, I played really well, I scored two goals or I did, or I, whatever, whatever happened, this wasn't the same to me. So I wanted to be part of a community. Um, so yeah, basketball became a, a huge part of my life through junior high and high school, played at Western Canada, um, formed some incredible lifelong relationships at, at that school. All, that's really where my life changed was those I spent four years at Western, did an extra grade 12 year there, which was lots of fun. Um, so yeah, so I had a great, uh, great experience. Um, and I had, and all of it in Calgary, didn't really leave the city until grad school in my early twenties. That's awesome. And what about, what about, uh, growing up? Did you have siblings? Yeah, I have a brother who's uh, five years younger than me. Yeah. Okay, cool. And what about mom or dad? What did, what did they do for work? Yeah, so my dad was um, uh, was a training to be an engineer and ended up going into real estate. So we owned a, a home in Lower Mount Royal. Uh, the way I would describe, um, and I'll get back to the answering your question, but I would describe uh, where I lived in Mount Royal is I walked out my front door and I looked to my left and I saw reality, apartment buildings, uh, a certain level of poverty actually, uh, up and down the alleyways of our home. Um, and then I looked up the hill and I saw affluence. So I couldn't have actually grown up in a better uh, plot of land uh, 
maybe in the world. <laughs> awesome. um, you know, so yeah, so my, my, we, we had tenants, uh, we had borders. Um, so we had we lived in a quite a sizable house in Mount Royal, but we were not a traditional Mount Royal family. Um, we had people in the house at all times. My mother cooked for them. Uh, it's, it was our way of surviving. So my dad passed away when I was 13, um, and then my mom had to figure out a way to uh, keep things going. So uh, she went back to, uh, to school, became, uh, had worked in the television industry as an admin assistant, and then went into um, uh, some, some medical training and worked in the medical industry for a little bit. Um, so certainly that, that um, situation with my father and, and how all that unfolded uh, had a huge mark on who I am today and, and as it does for any young man or woman, um, you know, the, the way that it really worked for me during that time in terms of, you know, your whole thing is around learning and development. Well, uh, that those instances in life really shape who you end up becoming going forward. And the way that my mom chose to manage that is she just gave me freedom. So from the time I was 13 to about 19, uh, the world was free and, uh, um, I went for it, and that was good and bad, uh, mostly good, uh, mostly good. I was able to really go for it on a lot of fronts, and uh, there were some casualties along the way uh, uh, with that, but that was, a, I've said this one many times, that one of the greatest gifts that I received was how my mom chose to allow me to experience life uh, after my father passed away. Wow, that's, it's so interesting to me that I just had a guest on yesterday, uh, her name is Dr. Kendra Coates. She's a, she's a doctor of education in psychology down in the States where she works with Mindset Works, which is they, they work directly with Carol Dweck and, and her stuff. Yeah. Um, she described two things that you just described as well, which was her mom gave her a lot of freedom and she repeated the word freedom multiple times throughout the conversation um, in, ter in terms of helping her to be able to grow and learn, which is, it's really interesting to me that that's becoming a theme amongst many of the high performers that I've spoken to. Yeah, it, and I just, I'm going to mention a number of people uh, in, uh, in my time with you today, and I'm going to almost guarantee you that every one of them had some level of freedom to explore, uh, and that's what took, took them to the place that they landed in. And I'll just say this out loud because, you, as you know, I, I volunteer in the, in the club basketball uh, market here in Calgary, and it's, it's one of my great joys, and I cannot wait to get back to a position where we're back on the court with these young men and women. And one of the great tragedies are parents who don't do that. Um, and uh, they'll find their way, <laughs> but um, there's just – Parents are, are so cautious now and so concerned about their son or daughter experiencing failure. Um, uh, I was not as good as my mom at giving freedom to my children, but I was pretty good. And the, where, where our 19-year-old and 17-year-old have shaped up right now, a lot of it has been due to um, exposure, freedom of thought, ownership, um, responsibility. Uh, you know, it's... Yeah, you, you're gonna. This is not gonna be the first time where you go. Hey, I just talked to somebody about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna happen yeah. all the time, man. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, a couple of things I want to dig a little deeper into on on that. And the first is, if you had to describe mom with one word, would it be freedom, or or is there another one? Oh, well, care. I think um, her way of caring was giving freedom. Right. Okay. Yeah. And and what about dad? Um, that's a good question. Um, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to dig too deep there, but yeah, I think that's, a, I think I'm going to pass on that, to be honest. Okay. I don't think it'd be fair. I'd have to think through that one. And if I come, you can, if it pops to mind what the right word is, I'd, I'd come back to it. it, it uh, that one's more complicated. Totally. No, totally understand. The next, the next question I would have, um, would be more around the borders. I'm, I'm interested in, in how you maybe reflect back and, and was there, did you gain anything from having that kind of in and out, I would assume kind of transient situation at home where there's people coming and going all the time and, you, and you're building relationships, like you're, you're extremely effective at, at relationship building. Do you think that there's any of that that could be attributed to that experience? Probably, but I have trouble drawing a straight line between it. Um, uh, I think 
uh, my ability to deal with, once I settle down, to deal with change. I'm pretty good at dealing with change most of the time. Yeah. Um, uh, it takes me a little bit of time, but uh, there was a lot of change that occurred, you know, when you're dealing with new tenants coming in and kind of people in your space all the time and um, a change in the dynamics of your, of your parent, um, apologies for the note there or the noise there. Um, the, the reality is that, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm adaptable. Not in the moment, like in the very, the very second, I'd like to be better in the very second when I get emotional, but yeah, so adaptability would be, would be one, um, would be the big one, I think. Yeah. Okay. And speaking of adaptability and, and change management, and, and the, that is definitely a strength of yours. How many, maybe you can't, maybe you don't know off the top of your head, how many cities have you lived in? Well, I know that um, our son is on his 12th or 13th bedroom. And he's 19. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, so I've, uh, my, I've lived, my wife and I have lived in uh, Calgary, Pocatello, uh, Idaho. I went to grad school in Pocatello, uh, Boston, um, uh, and London, and Pittsburgh. So uh, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. And, and, and home, in London, we lived in three different homes because we were tenants. We were, we were renting and we had to move. So that's where the, the number of bedrooms comes right. in with my, with our, with our son. We think it is his, his, and obviously when you get into university, you're in a lot of bedrooms, but um, you know, it, it's, it's 10 or 11 that he had. So yeah, we've, we've moved around just enough, but we've been back in Calgary for a decade, which has been amazing. It was, it was kind of, it was almost our plan that we right. thought if we're going to move, we can do it early. I, I'll never forget when we, um, we had our, our children were born in Pittsburgh. Um, both our, our son and our daughter were born in Pittsburgh and we, we were there for about two and a half years and, uh, we just looked at each, each other one Christmas and said, what are we doing here? Like, and we were in incredible jobs. You know, I was starting to march up the, the ladder in division one basketball. Helen was in a great job with no chemicals. Um, and, uh, my, uh, my boss at Duquesne University decided it would be a good idea to go on a trip for two tournaments and, and not be home for Christmas. And our, uh, our daughter was a month old and I missed her first Christmas at, at a month. Now she doesn't remember that. So, <laughs> but I remember coming and but Helen was on her own with two young kids and, and I'm away and I'm in, I'm in Florida or Puerto Rico or somewhere at a tournament. I remember coming home from that. We just looked at each other and said, we're going home. Um, uh, so we came up to Calgary um, and uh, I was the athletic director at Mount Royal uh, during that stretch. And then she got a call to go to London and, so we were kind of had settled down two and a half years of kind of having some time at home. Life was a bit more normal. And I remember getting on the plane to go to London and it, 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 for the kids, it was like we were going on a trip. Um, so I, I share all that because, and, I, and I mentioned it because of the 10 year time period we've had been here in Calgary is we, we, we knew we could do it early, but we right. knew we, we just knew that once they got into like junior high, we had to lock down. Um, so it's worked out really well for us. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. And, and the amount of places you've been is not unrelated to the amount of people and, and what I would describe as extraordinary people that you've been fortunate enough to work with and, and meet and that kind of thing. And I think that's a perfect segue into uh, some of the learning that, that uh, you, can, you can help us with today. Um, so I, I'd love to just dive in because I know, I know that you have, a lot, you have a lot you want to share and I want to make sure that we don't get tight for time. So how about how about when we talk when we talk about all this movement and and change and and your adaptability i'm i'm wondering how you did with your your own identity and your sense of self and and what your goals were as you kind of bopped around a lot because in my experience when i just just working with with athletes and teachers and and that sort of thing change oftentimes brings a lot of questioning about who I am, what I want, and that kind of thing. And, and I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to how, how that affected you and then any other learning you have around that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I just got dead lucky. Uh, so the, the, I'll, uh, well, the year after my dad passed away, I, I uh, uh, can remember being in my junior high basketball practice. And um, 
uh, I was told that the coaches from Western Canada High School uh, were coming over to run a practice. Um, and uh, we were in their, the catchment area, so it was all kind of pretty normal. They were just going to come and check in on us. And Al Price and Wayne Thomas walked through the, the doors. <laughs> so, you know, I'll never forget them walking through uh, those doors in their 30s. And they taught us stuff that did very ba basic basketball stuff, but I thought they were, um, they walked on water. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I went through a phase after my dad. Well, really, I went, I've been in a phase since I was 13 of chasing male role models. That's literally what my life has been outside of, you know, um, my family and my time with Helen and, and having two amazing kids. But that has my, it has literally been a quest to find male role models to replace my father. Um, and to have, if, if I had been going to a different school with people with different principles than Al and Wayne, and Al and Wayne aren't perfect. So for those people who are listening who don't know, um, Al Price is a um, longtime Calgary educator who ended up going uh, uh, into work with uh, Axia Technology here in town after a, started a, a principalship at William Aberhart. Um, and Wayne Thomas is a longtime educator, basketball coach, counselor, a legend. Uh, here in the Calgary system who, who um, for me to just run into them and for them to lean back into me when I leaned into them is answers all the questions you had around who I am. Because I encountered those two gentlemen and then a, a third individual at uh, Western Canada High School named Kevin Pelios, who has since passed away, who, who is my, um, uh, the person I spent the very most time, the most time with of any of my friends over the last 30 years. Uh, and he was my teacher. Um, and then, uh, you know, threw on a couple of others, Gary Howard, the University of Calgary coach, uh, who I coached with for a year. Um, all of them are principled people. And, you know, treat people well, work hard, be humble, be curious. Um, don't do it the wrong way, do it the right way. So that just was like, it was like a, somebody took a needle and injected me with that and boom, you're done. So long as I, so as I went, so now the question, your question goes back to, you know, adaptability and, and how do you show up in these moments? And so for me, when I went, um, I guess my first, uh, the first moment of adaptability was going from grad school to when I got the job at Mount Royal as the women's basketball coach, that was my first kind of big step is like, you know, I got to adapt now. I've, I've, I've coached before, but not as a head coach of a college program. Well, what am I doing? Well, I just went back to those foundational, those foundational principles. I was terrible that first year. I should be sending apology notes to all of those girls. Um, I, w I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, we all that. I, I, had, uh, I had some foundational principles in place that those gentlemen, who are my mentors, gave me. And then if I were to you know, ratchet forward 10, whatever years, 12 years, um, not that long, I guess. But when I moved to Pittsburgh, after being in my role for seven years, as I leaned into that experience and I knew that I would have to, I was basically entering into a space where I was nothing. So I'd had seven years of, I did okay. We did okay at, at Mar, at Mar Royal, um, one year with the women, six with the men, but didn't matter. So uh, just going back to the principles of um, be humble, work hard, lean into people, be human, be curious, learn as much as you can. You know, and, and I, I was just telling my son the story when, um, we were on a walk. I'm telling my son lots of stories over the last couple of weeks that I haven't told him before, um, for whatever reason, on these long walks. And when I went to when I went to Pittsburgh, um, I thought, well, I, my wife's got a good job. I may as well go for it and try the Division One level. And what I did was I found a a, 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 a university that had a um, an opening, and it was Robert Morris University. And I basically leveraged every single connection I could find to knew, who knew the, the head coach, because the head coach didn't know me. And I ended up connecting with Jack Donahue, the head coach of the national team, who coached this guy in high school. He actually coached, um, uh, as some people know, Jack Donahue coached uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at Power Memorial in New York. And one of his teammates was a guy named Danny Nee. And uh, so I got, I had, and Danny was the coach of Robert Morris. So I had to act, give Danny a call and, and that, that led to me getting the job. So, cool. so I think long winded way of saying, what was that about? Well, basic principles, keep trying, figure out connections. Don't be, 
maybe it goes back to the borders. Like I'm not scared to talk to anybody really. So um, I don't care how old they are or how important they are. Uh, yeah. So I think that, that your, your question was around like, how did you know who you were? What were your foundation principles? It's all about that moment when those two guys walked in the gym in Mount Royal. That's awesome. And, and I guess a, a question that that brings out in me is how did you get to the point where you have reached a level of kind of self-actualization that you can, you can say I'm chasing male role models or I've always chased male, male role models. Cause that's like, I, I think that that's a lot easier for you and sorry if I'm using the word easy too cavalier, but I think that was easier for you to say than I, I would imagine a lot of people would be able to say in terms of their sense of themselves and their, yeah. I, I don't want to say confidence, but just really knowing their own identity. Yeah. What an awesome question. Um, I don't know. I don't know when that happens, but yeah. I can just tell you that like, it's just so easy right now. Like yeah. it has been, it has been for the last, um, probably the last five years, I think. I think there was something about kind of where my career was um, between 2011, 2015, particularly like right around 2015 when I, I left a job because um, I was pretty certain about the reasons for leaving it. And it, it filled me with confidence, frankly, when I made that decision. For me to be, and I'll, I'll, still, I'll never forget the time that I, I said that out loud in front of a lot of people. It was at my 50th birthday. Um, I said, that's been my whole thing, is it? But I think, you know, Ken, you're on to something because for many people, we're scared to say those things. Totally. Yeah. Um, we're, 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 and I think I was for a long, and I, well, actually, I didn't even understand it. Yeah, <laughs> it, took yeah. me, it took me 30 years to figure it out. So that's all, because I, even just asking that question, I was wondering if you were going to say like, yeah, well, I had to, it took me this amount of time and I had to talk to some people and really dig down deep and find it. And I think the the answer of it, it being like, yeah, it just, it, it came to you. Like there, there was a, a, almost like a threshold or a rite of passage, I guess that. I think, I think there's something about as we age and we accomplish things and we know that all these foundational, so let's say we're, um, let's say the whole, the whole thing of life is climbing a mountain. And I know I'm trying to get to the top, but there's like this ledge halfway or three quarters of the way that people are saying, you're not even going to get to that ledge. Well, there's something that you know, I think that can happen if you're ambitious and curious and really lean into life where you hit, you get to that ledge halfway, two thirds of the way through life. And I think that's, I kind of got to that ledge and I got to, there's a really cool viewpoint from that ledge that I can, I got to just look and say, you know, I went, I moved to Pittsburgh and I coached three years of NCAA play basketball. And I, I moved, I moved to London and somehow I became the general manager of the British Olympic men's and women's teams. Um, and there's incredible fortune involved in those. It, my intention when I moved to London was I wanted to, um, I wanted to get back to coaching basketball part-time and be a dad. I didn't want to do what ended up happening. Um, yeah. I'm glad I did. Uh, but, uh, so yeah, I think Ken, there's, it's, there's confidence built into that, right? You have to feel really comfortable. You, you could tell, like I have no problem saying it. And there's other yeah. things that I can say that maybe others would, would struggle with. But, um, I think if my, if my journey was a bit more broken and I hadn't accomplished as much, uh, and not, and not big accomplishment, but, but, but just things that I really wanted to do that were important to me, it would be harder for me to say that out loud. Right. And, there's a there's probably an interesting formula in there that that if we really hammer down, which is for another time we could, where it's it's that leaning in and and kind of that authentic self showing up on a day in and day out basis, creating realistic goals and then viewing and perceiving those goals as success when you when you hit them um, is is a is a bit of a roundabout way to get to why you're able to say that, I think, why you're able to confidently sit there and say, yeah, but it all, I mean, every, everything in leadership and coaching starts with self-awareness. Right. It's just, it's, it is the whole game. Yeah. Uh, there, there is no uh, truly great leader or coach who does not lean on self-awareness on a regular basis. It just doesn't happen. People who are seen as great leaders or coaches that aren't self-aware are just really lucky. Okay. Really, really lucky. 
They've got, um, uh, they've got money. Um, one of the things I saw in the NCAA is that money hides um, foibles. Um, you know, it, it, when you've got a big budget, you can gloss over a gap. Uh, one of the things I love about my about Canadian coaches, and I have every intention until I can no longer work, of supporting Canadian coaches in their pursuit of becoming better, is that they have to become Renaissance people. They, they're, they're generally speaking in this country, there's no money to gloss over gaps. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're fully exposed. <laughs> um, you become the master of all, and that's what you know. One of the things I, I, I found. It's not a question you've asked, but I'm going to share it anyways. Is when I first got to Pittsburgh, I can remember I'm in my kind of midway through the first season. I was with Robert Morris in the men's program. And I, I loved the guys I coached with. They were awesome, unbelievable people. Um, but I realized halfway through, I know a lot. And it's because when I was in my role for seven years, I had to cut tape, figure out strategy. I was a sports psychologist. I was an athletic therapist. Um, I had to manage up, manage down, manage out. And these guys, a lot of them end up just becoming specialists in particular areas. So there was nothing, there was literally nothing I couldn't do on that staff. Cool. And let's, you know what, let's dive right in now that, now that you, now that you've opened that door, let's go right into knowing who you are and and really understanding yourself as a leader. And, And can you explain why, maybe not why, but I guess explain how, how that is the, I guess, first step in leadership and coaching. Well, I think ultimately if we're, if all coaches and leaders are, are, are performance people, you are the accountable officer of performance. Your team, your team, your athlete performs and you are accountable for that. Um, that that's the bottom line. So you can, you can distance yourself from, the performance of the Toronto Blue Jays or the Boston Red Sox um, at, at, as much as you want. But if you are the manager of that team or a coach or a, or a discipline coach, I mean, you have to own that performance. So if that's the, the ultimate purpose of a coach or a leader, if you can't monitor and assess your own performance, how you're performing in the moment, which is self-assessment, then you, 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 how, can you, how can you extrapolate it out to, into a program? Totally. Um, so I think, Ken, it, it's, uh, and, and ultimately, as a coach or a, a leader, you're, you are performing at every single moment. Yeah. Um, so that having that now, having that, if, you're a self, if your self-assessment mechanism is on full blast at all times, you're, you're incapacitated. You, you can't function, right? We've seen those people too, right? It's like, well, maybe I should do that, maybe I shouldn't, but let's just see how that goes. Um, there has, there's a healthy balance between, okay, and as you know, one of my kind of my theme today as we talk is around knowing what good looks like and then being able to self, uh, be self-aware, right? So yep. you've got to know what good looks like and what, so your basketball team, your baseball team, your accounting uh, firm, um, this is what good looks like. This is what I want our program to be targeting, to be aiming for, um, get to work, do the stuff, lean in, go for it, be curious, but then find those regular moments where you are self-assessing. Uh, and that can be after practice. If you and I are coaching together and you came to me and say, how do you think that went? I, I'd say maybe it's a 10 second debrief. Uh, you know, I think we could have been better. We weren't as clear at the beginning of practice. All right, let's work on that tomorrow to maybe it's quarterly check-ins, um, of, uh, of, of self-awareness, but, uh, um, but, but ultimately, um, those coaches who aren't always thinking about how am I showing up and how am I influencing and how am I helping to make, you know, like what can I do to make this player better? Uh, if they're just, if they're all they're focused on is that player can't do that or, you know, we're, we're just not capable of doing this. They're just narrating. Right. Um, and narrating is a, narrating is a very healthy, normal habit that coaches have. You need to narrate. It's a way to vent, flush things out but you need to get out of narrating fast and get into, okay. Um, I know, uh, my daughter, uh, Katie, you know, so my daughter, Katie Watilla, she, she, uh, let's say I was coaching her and, um, okay. She struggled in this, this one area area and she had an awesome time in this area. What are we going to do about this other area? What's the strategy there? Um, yeah, so that's super important. Awesome. And, and so 
that begs the question, how do we get to knowing what good looks like for us? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, so, um, Ken, you know, I'm just a huge believer that the great, the great, great coaches know what good looks like for them. And in my world, the two that I often speak of are Ken Shields and Dave Smart. Um, uh, and I'll, and even I'll, I'll include Dan Van Horn in that because um, I can tell stories about all, all three of them. Uh, basketball is my game. I can, I'd like to be able to speak the same way with other sports, but I, but I, in, in my work right now with on the podium, I certainly can to, to a certain degree, but basketball is easiest for me to speak to. Um, you know, Dan, Dave, and Ken all know what good looks like to them. There's just no disputing it. You know, Dave's, Dave's clarity of what he wants his basketball team to look like in every situation is clear. Same with Dan, um, uh, and same with Ken through his success as the coach of the University of Victoria Vikings. Um, uh, so, and just to be clear, uh, Dan Van Horn is the head coach of the men's basketball program at the University of Calgary, and Dave Smart is uh, now head of basketball for men and women at Carleton. Um, so, so they they have it their own, and I don't know whether they've written it down or not. I actually I do know Ken has. That's a guarantee. I haven't. I don't know about uh, Dan and and Dave, but I'm I'm going to share my screen just to show a couple other examples of how people go about um, identifying what good looks like. And so this is. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have a signed version of the Wooden Pyramid, thanks to my good friend Corey Russell, the former University of Calgary um, basketball coach. He got me this. Um, so this is John Wooden, the famous UCLA basketball coach. It's his effort at saying this is what success looks like, and for him, it's a journey. So the base is the is where you start, um, and to get to competitive greatness, greatness, you have to work through all of these things. You can't skip boxes. So, so for him, he was incredibly committed, curious about this journey and the details of it. So he knows he can literally be checking in midway through a practice, midway through a season, midway through a 10-year period. Where are we at on this? Uh, another example of this um, uh, Ken is in the work I do with On the Podium, and I'm not sharing any secrets because this is um, publicly accessible on the On the Podium web website. So um, in my current uh, life, I am the lead high performance coaching advisor for the Coaching Enhancement Program, which is um, a coaching development program for Olympic and Paralympic coaches that is supported by all of the high performance partners in Canada, uh, the, the Canadian Olympic Committee, Paralympic Committee, Coach Association of Canada, Own the Podium, Sport Canada. It's an incredible initiative. Uh, three years in, and and um, and may it may it run for for many many more years in support of our Olympic and Paralympic coaches. This is our. Um, it took us it took us a year to build this. It looks pretty simple, <laughs> but we had lots of healthy debate around what a, a world class coach looked like. And for us, it it is this: uh, is that a, in Canada, ethics and values are paramount. Um, we also need to recognize that one moment the coach is teaching somebody how to guard a ball, guard a ball screen or shoot a basket, basketball, uh, and the next one they're running a meeting on, on recruiting. What's our plan for recruiting in the next two years? What's our plan for fundraising? Um, and then they, these eight boxes represents the competencies that coaches have to have or they need to hire in through their staff appointments because uh, if they don't have them all, they're going to be compromised. And then ultimately, the key behaviors are these three. How do you influence players or others? How do you influence your athletic director? How do you influ influence um, people ac in the academic world at a university? Provide solutions and define reality for the people around you. So um, to your question was around, you know, how do you go about understanding this? I don't think, no, I don't, I know that coaches don't do it that often enough. Um, I never... I mean, I kind of did that when I coached um, at Mont Royal and in uh, in Pittsburgh, um, but I really didn't do it properly again until uh, just recently when I've been coaching uh, on the girls' side with my daughter and her friends uh, in the Calgary Basketball Academy, where I went back to a very very simple model for me, um, which was uh, super helpful. So I encourage all leaders and coaches to spend a moment to identify what does good really look like. 
Yeah, and I think my biggest challenge with that is around I know I know what good looks like in a lot of I guess tunnels of of my my team or or my program or or whatever I'm working with them. So I know I know what ball screen defense, what my good ball screen defense looks like. I know what good shooting footwork looks like. I know I know what good team defense in the half court, full court. Like I I know those. Is there any advice for that in the moment where you maybe you maybe don't have that standard yet. You haven't you don't have that defined for yourself yet. Is it really just trial and error? Is it is it about being free to figure it out in that moment or is it about is it about really trying to have uh like a staple of one two three things or something like that that are non-negotiables that build all of your goods if that makes sense. Man, that's a good question. <laughs> I could see a case to be made that you keep it so simple. Um, and I, I, I've told, I know, I know I've told you this story before. I've told others this story before. Um, so I'm, I'm, I have two answers for you. One is if you're not sure about like the full, like let's go back to Wooden's Pyramid. Like that's a really detailed thing. And within each box is like a whole chapter of a book, right? Like, yep. That you would yep. go to. Um, and in, and if you take that, like basketball, you could literally, you could break, tickle the boxes in the pyramid. There's going to be ball screen defense. There's going to be off ball defense. There's going to be defensive transition. Maybe there's 40 boxes that you would, but he, if you can't get your head to that yet. And I think that, that Dan and Dave and Ken all have that sorted out. Yeah. Right. But let's say you're not ready for that yet. And I, the example I'll give is I, a team I was coaching last spring of, of young ladies in grade 11. Um, it's the most, it, like it is, I've been involved in every level of basketball except the NBA. Yep. I have. Um, and it was the most rewarding basketball experience in my life. Those hundred days. And, it, and, and our three things, our pyramid were compete, support, adapt. I didn't look at a box score, not one time that hundred days. I, 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 I watched very little videotape. And all I did was focus on, are we competing? Are we supporting each other? Are we adapting? And, I, and each of those three words could mean different things. Like adapting could be like, okay, ball screen coverage, or how do we guard a six foot five girl in the post who's going to play in the WNBA one day? Yeah. Um, you know, like that kind of stuff. So, um, so I guess I'm answering it two ways to say, if you're not ready for the, for the, for the Ken Shields, Dave Smart, Dan Van Horn version, um, of having to really nut it down. And, and ultimately, if you're going to be like, if you're going to be a university basketball coach or your whatever, whatever it may be, like if you're a leader and it, the detail has to be there, you're going to have to get there at some point in time, start high level, like start, start high level and don't, and because each of those guys, as I'll use as examples, those guys have core principles around competing, supporting each other, how you treat people, how you really dig in during competitive moments. Um, that's where I would start. I'd start high level. Um, cause, cause invariably if you're always doing compete, support, adapt, if you screw up a little bit around the details of how you run an out of bounds play or set a screen, you'll be okay. Yeah. But if you're violating on a regular basis, those big, you know, like if I go back to, um, uh, I'm just going to go back to sharing screens for a second here. And if I go back to the, the, uh, uh, world-class coaching framework, um, you know, if, if we're really awesome here as a Canadian Olympic coach, but we, but we are, are, are not solid on ethics and values, sooner or later in this country, we're done. Right. So I, I think that, you know, obviously that's the reason we put it first and foremost here it was uh, as high profile as possible. Yeah, I like that. And, and just for clarification and uh, for everybody watching it, when you say high level, you're not, you do not mean high level of performance or high level of, of athletics or high level of, of competition, you mean high level of overarching principles that, sure. that yeah, cover like everything. The filtering down of, uh, yeah, so we're not, yeah, thanks, Ken. I mean, high level would be if, if we were working on um, uh, a Boy Scouts plan for the next two years, we're running yeah. the Boy Scouts, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to disparage Boy Scouts in any way, but if we're dealing with like 15 boys in the community and we want to figure out how to help them, the high level would be just what does it look like from here? and not, not drilling down to the, the detail. Totally. 
Um, can you can you speak a little bit to? I, I kind of want to tie those two threads together because we've talked we've talked now a lot about you knowing who you are and the importance of of leaders and 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 anybody in, in positions of performance or leadership knowing who they are. And then we've talked about knowing what good looks like. And and do you see that, like, if we think about Dave, Ken, um, do you see do you see that they those two things are tied? That they know who they are and who they are also helps them create what good looks like. Are those very much connected? I think so. Yeah, because yeah. if you're if you're faking, if you're faking it a little bit, you're going to have trouble declaring something really as solidly as you have to. Like, because when you go to defining something like, you know, a recipe, you know, this is my recipe for French toast. This is, I, no, that doesn't go in it. It's, this is what I, it, it's, it is that. And, and I've seen so many coaches who haven't made the journey through to figure, in, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, who haven't made, through, made the journey through around figuring out who am I? What's most important to me? And then what gets compromised is the deliverables on the technical tactical side. Right. Um, uh, and, but I can also say to you that I've, I've worked with some coaches who I confronted very directly to say, you have to decide what it is you want to be and who you want to be. Take time to do that. And they came out the other side. Unbelievable. Right. Um, and in our program with on the podium, the coaching answer program, um, we use the term invasive often. Uh, we are incredibly invasive. Um, I'm so proud of it uh, and have the, you know, 95% of the coaches respond exceptionally well and end up coming out the other side in a, in a place where they, they're not, they're not able to do it yet, but they have a better chance of defining that that what the ingredients to the recipe are, um, you know, and a couple of, just a couple other examples that I'll, I'll, I'll give of guys that I've been around. It's harder for me to give example of, of, of those guys and gals who struggle, but, um, Nick nurse who coaches the Raptors, as you are aware, Ken, um, Nick was our assistant coach with the British Olympic team for four years and, uh, is a good friend of mine. And Chris Finch, who was our, uh, who was our head coach with the British Olympic team as an assistant coach, the lead assistant coach with the new Orleans Pelicans, um, both of those guys are the same guys right now that I, that I knew, uh, in the run up to London and, uh, and part of, I knew right away, Nick was going to thrive in that role, uh, whether as, as assistant or head coach, because he knows who he is. He will not change under any circumstances. Um, and he knows what good looks like and same with Chris. So just a couple other, uh, other examples and, and, what allowed, you know, what allowed them to do that? Like I'm going, I'm connecting the dots here, right? With, mm -hmm. uh, real people, you know, real learning, real people. Yep. I'm going to suggest to you that, that, that Dave and Dan and Ken and Nick and Chris all had some and me, and I'm not comparing myself to them as coaches. I just am good. I'm happy to be part of the conversation with them. Absolutely. I'm going to, I'm going to suggest that every single one of those guys had a platform to experiment and learn that gave them freedom and didn't restrict them. Um, I know enough about Ken's background. I know enough about David's background and around the principles that were instilled in him. Um, Nick and Nick and uh, Chris both, were American guys who went over to uh, who played uh, Nick, Nick played Division One basketball. Chris was recruited by Duke. Um, knew he'd be a, a deep in the bench guy at Duke, and ended up going to um, uh, Thomas and Jefferson. I might be getting that wrong in Pennsylvania, and actually played in the Division Three final championship uh, game in his last year and lost, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but both went over to Britain after that time and played and coached and it was like a playground for them. Like if you, if you dig deep into what they've been through um, and same with Dave, Dave's whole thing was a big playground as a coach that when you get up, get to, when you get to have a playground to experiment with figuring out who you are and what matters to you, because now, and now if, once you're in the playground, now you actually have to go do something with it. You better know who you are because you have nobody else to hide behind. 
Right. Whereas in some situations, if you go into a corporation and um, you're like, you know, you can kind of hide, you don't really need to be sure of who you are. Same with NCAA Division I basketball in my mind is you can go in there and do your thing and you've got your lane and you do that. But if you really figured out who you are, well, all five of those guys, Dan, you know, all of those guys would have had to have been so sure of who they are as human beings because they're on an island. Yeah. <laughs> there's, no, there's nowhere for them to hide. And I think ultimately that's what I'll connect it to another thing that I, that I um, mentioned before is just our kids and youth sport is, is I want, I want my, my son and my daughter to be put on an island exposed. Um, you know, my son, my son's in, it, through his second year of playing post-secondary basketball on the East Coast, and he's been exposed. And it's the greatest thing ever. Um, and I'm proud of the exposure that my, my daughters had to go through. And I, I, I believe that if we don't get that, the things you're asking about around knowing who you are and being able to understand what good looks like is way harder for people who haven't been, been exposed. So what does seeking exposure mean to you? Um, uh, making yourself vulnerable, uh, taking risks, failing, ensuring failing exists, happens, ensuring it, 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 it happens. Um, and having to productively deal with the consequences because that is growth. Awesome. And, and part of the reason why I asked the question, the main reason is that I want to understand fully what exposure means to you, because I think that that's a really concrete way for people to frame how to get better is by fully understanding what exposure means. And the second thing, uh, and this is just a small part, is that exposure in 2020 means very different things to young athletes than exposure might mean to, in 2020, to you or I. Where, yeah. So if they're, if they're hearing exposure, they might think, well, I need people to see me or know me. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, actually, it's, it's, uh, they'll, they'll see you and know you. You want them to see you and know you at your worst so you can get better. Yeah. Yeah. They, um, uh, you know, taking, having to take as much responsibility as possible. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm always reminded that, that uh, this is really what people want when I talk to university coaches, um, as I do with the club kids that we're supporting at, at the Calgary Basketball Academy, whether it's girls or boys, um, they're not, they're not using the word exposed, you know, are they exposed? Are they responsible? They want to know who they really are. Like right. day in, day out. I mean, not, they don't want the highlight tape. They want to know like what, you know, how, how resilient is this kid? Um, and that's, I try and share that with, with parents is that, um, you know, so your, your kid, um, uh, isn't scoring 15 points a game, um, but they're scoring eight points a game and they're, they're toughing it out, uh, uh, defensively and, and, and rebounding. I mean, there's more to it than just these numbers that, that uh, parents may be looking for, but, uh, yeah, coaches definitely are looking for the resilient kid. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, as just as I wrap up here, are, is there anything you're reading right now or anything that you've got that's a, that's a staple for you? Um, <laughs> Uh, well, the best leadership book that I can recommend is Leadership as an Art by Max Dupree. Um, it's just the simplest, most basic um, uh, leadership book there is. And I think all, I, I've given that book to people who have read dozens and dozens of leadership books and they've taken something from it. So I, I, I really use that's my only recommendation. I'm currently reading the Dream Team um, story uh, from the 92 games, just yeah. a, a bit of a distraction right now. but. Uh, um, yeah, I can't, I can't recommend, uh, leadership as an art, art more highly. Cool. Uh, if, if anybody wanted to follow you or learn more about the, some of the stuff you're doing, is there a place that they can do that website? Yeah, my LinkedIn profile, it's a bit quiet right now, but, um, uh, would, uh, there's, I've written 25 articles on varying themes around this that I'm super proud of. And, Almost every topic Ken, you and I have spoken of uh, today has, has, been t has been touched on through those articles. So I'd encourage people to follow me on LinkedIn. I'll, I'll um, keep writing because I, I love it and uh, um, want to get people thinking about these topics. 
Yeah. And I've, I've read every one of those and I think that it's, you're probably getting close to the point of maybe needing to think about writing your own book. I would say. I started a book. Uh, I, I work uh, because I work for, um, I work for own the podium. Uh, I fly a lot back and forth from Ottawa. So I've written a lot of stuff <laughs> and I'm, yeah. uh, I think I'm on chapter two or three of a book of, uh, that deals with the gap between, um, uh, expectations and uh, resources. So, uh, We'll see. Maybe this is a time to get back into that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the, and the last question I ask everybody is if you could give a phrase or, or two, two lines or so on learning that you think everybody really needs to try to grab onto, what, what would that be? I think it's it. You get to know who you are. Get Just get to know who you are. Um, figure out ways to understand how, how you're wired. Uh, and then I would, uh, uh, I'm giving a bit of a, um, a, uh, a high, virtual high five to a colleague of mine named Judy Rigi, R-I-E-G-E. Um, she's an emotional intelligence expert and offers a tool called uh, EQ in action. So letter E, letter Q in action. And it's a tool that measures your, um, emotional intelligence. And I would tell you that, that in the last 10 years, I haven't had a more profound um, coming to terms with who I am than reading my emotional intelligence profile, which okay. my wife told me that she had been telling me for years was, was in place, <laughs> but I didn't believe. But I would, 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 I would uh, you know, to sum that up, it would be, you, you just, you really got to lean into, who, into figuring out who you are and what you stand for. Um, it'll make everything else easier. Awesome. That's, that's, that's a really, really concrete way to wrap this up and, and something really solid to, to leave everyone with. So I really got to say, thank you, Ron. I, I appreciate all the insight and, and I think you have enough for a book. So we probably could have kept this going quite a bit longer if we, if we had all day, but, uh, I, I know that the people watching this are really going to appreciate all the stuff that they're able to get out of this and, and appreciate the fact that you were able to be super candid and, and really dig deep on some of the things I was asking you. So thank you very much. Ken, my pleasure. And uh, I wish you the best with your future interviews. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get podcasts or to this YouTube channel to hear our weekly episodes. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Jersey B. We come from different walks of life and see the darkness and the light. Yeah. Had to deal with strife and put up constant sacrifice.